Hi, welcome to MA342 Lecture 12 in Topology. Um, the first thing I should do is remind people there's a an Ocazon homework due, is it this week? Is it this Friday? Can anybody tell me in the chat? I think it's this Friday. Yeah, 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 this Friday. So so don't forget that. There's the uh, and that homework is is all about compactness and proving that the interval a closed interval from zero to one is compact so so don't forget that um the second thing i want to talk about is there's a project element to this module um and that project element is worth 25 percent and now where's my thing i, I i'm trying to find I got too many windows open on my computer. Hang on, uh, lecture twelve. Okay, I'm going to move this over. So let me just say a little bit about um, the project. So um, I want everybody to write an article on topology. That's the that's the basic essence so and that article is worth 25 percent of your mark for ma342 so um and the other thing i'm going to do is i'm going to collect all of your articles together and i'm going to stick them up on the web page for the whole world to see so they're going to be published online uh, so i want you to write an article and it has to be good enough that you can live with it going online um so what else? Uh, I'll, I, th these details I'll send round uh, through Blackboard after this lecture. But then the basic details are the, the, the article is going to count 25%. Each article should be written by either two or three people. Okay, so no single author articles will be allowed and no articles with four people will be allowed. So it's either two or three. Um, so if you can find one or two people to, to collaborate with, that's grand. And if you're having difficulty finding somebody to collaborate with, that's no problem either. Just email me and I'll, I'll, I'll keep a list of all the wallflowers and I'll stick them together in groups of two or three. Okay, so if you want help finding a partner, email me and I, I leave it a week or so and I'll get a list of people who are looking for partners and I'll, I'll bundle them together. But if you can find your own partners, that's fine as well. But there has to be at least two. So no single author because it's a collaborative project. So you can't collaborate if you're on your own and no more than three. So you can't have four. OK, um, the length of the article. So. Uh, for a two author article, five pages maximum. I don't want it any longer than five pages. You've got to say what you're going to say in five pages, no more, for 25%. Um, if you were able to publish a five page article in a mathematical journal, you'd probably get a PhD for it. So that's, you know, that's the density of mathematics. When mathematics is published, it doesn't go on for page after page after page. It's quite terse. So a five-page article for, for for two authors. And what I've said is if you if you're gonna work in groups of three, I've opted it to eight. So if you if there's three of you, I'll allow an eight-page article. Um no more. Uh and probably not too much less either. Um what else? That's point two. Point three. The article should be submitted as a PDF file. So that's the only thing I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll go into how you submit uh, later, but I want a PDF file and I want it written in LaTeX. So you have to learn, if you haven't used LaTeX before, you just have to learn. But the, the, in, in this thing I'll send around, um, LaTeX, um, it's easy to do these days online using Overleaf. So um, yeah, just out of curiosity. Has anybody not used LaTeX? I, I don't. I mean, has any in in the chat or, or speak to me? Has anybody not used LaTeX? Just just give me give me a, f a flavor of how many have not used LaTeX. Has anybody never used LaTeX? Oh, it's looking good. 
then you've all used it. Okay, that's great, okay. Um, and then not only is it gonna be in LaTeX, but I want you to get a feel for what it's like for being a mathematician. So as a mathematician, when you have your idea and you write it up, you then submit it to a journal, and a journal has constraints regarding the 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 presentation of your article. So what I'm uh, insisting is that you go to the um, proceedings of the American Mathematical Society. You find it online, and you look at what you have to do to submit an article to the proceedings, and you have to follow the guidelines to the letter. If you don't follow the guidelines to the letter, you'll lose marks. So, um, for example, the guidelines are choose an appropriate communicating editor. I want you to do that. I want you to look through the AMS and say, who, what's the most appropriate editor for this article you're writing? And list that person. Say, don't actually send it to that person, but list it. So I want you to get a, you know, to get a feel for what mathematicians do on a daily basis. I want you to have an abstract of, the, of an appropriate length. Uh, I want you to include a primary and possibly a secondary mathematical subject classification. So the, uh, there's a mathematics subject classification. There are numbers. Each, each area of mathematics is given a number. And when you submit an article, you usually, and, and always to the AMS, you stick the, the number of the area or areas that you're writing about. So I want you to, to look that up. And if you don't put that, you'll lose a mark. Uh, and I want you to have a, a proper bibliography of all the papers or books that you've used. But again, it's only a five page article you're writing, so you don't want kind of two pages of bibliography. It has to be proportional. And then what do you write about? Well, this is up to you, okay? So there's, it, it's, it's up to you. You can write about whatever you want. Um, what have I said here? Possible topics. So the MA342 exam syllabus is defined by the problem sheet. So this module, it, its syllabus is defined by the problem sheet and, and past exam papers. And you're free to write about anything that complements this module. So I don't want you to take something that I've done in lectures and reproduce it. I want you to do something different, but which complements it. And the aim is that you, this, these, the collection of these articles, which will be published as a book uh, online, the aim of the articles is to help your peer, peers deepen their understanding of topology. So the article should not be written for me or for some professor of topology. The article should be written so that your peers will be able to understand it. So if there are words that your peers are supposed to know, like vector space or, or complex differentiable, whatever, you don't have to explain it. But if there are words that you've learned in order to write your article or, or ideas that your peer group wouldn't know, then you have to explain those because you're writing for your peer group in this, in this module. Um, and then what do you write about? Well, anything which complements uh, the module. I'm a bit reluctant to give ideas because what will happen is I give some ideas and loads of people will use the few, few ideas that I give. But I mean, any idea is fine. But I have just to give you a flavor uh, what I've said. You could choose an interesting definition and illustrate it because a lot of deep mathematics is based on an appropriate definition. You could take something of a definition, um, a fiber bundle, differentiable manifold, whatever. I say, what does it mean? And just illustrate the definition and in five pages you know if it's a good definition uh, worthy of five pages that would be a good article or you could take a theorem maybe a theorem in the book out of armstrong uh, which i haven't had time to prove and state and you could state and prove a theorem you could uh, write about the life of a topologist you could go online and find there are plenty of famous topologists, plenty of Fields medalists who, who are topologists or some, some, some important mathematician or a historical figure like Poincaré or something. You could write about that person's life if, if you know, that, that type of a, an article suits you better. You could write about a, a recent trend in topology. So you could go into MathSciNet and find what are the, the latest kind of buzzwords in topology and write about them. And so on. You, you, could, you could write about anything you like which, which will help your peer group deepen their understanding of topology and which complements the topology syllabus, the MA342 syllabus. And then I've got some uh, ideas, uh, some, just a few of the ideas, but I mean, 
these are just to give you an idea. It'd be better to come up with your own ideas. You could discuss the following quote by Solzhenitsyn, who said, Topology, the stratosphere of human thought in the 24th century, it might just possibly be of use to somebody, but for the present... <laughs> now, you could discuss that. Is topology of any use to anybody in the 21st century? Um, you could explain a famous result, such as the Poincaré conjecture. What does it say? If you could really explain what the Poincaré conjecture says, that would be a great article. You're certainly not going to be able to give a proof of it, uh, but you could st state what it says. Um, or, you, as I say, some basic theorem from, from any book in topology, Armstrong's book, for example. Um, uh, or you could go to the Wikipedia where there's a list of theorems on topology and take one of those and write about one of those themes, and so on. You could talk about knot theory, what's a knot. Knots uh, occur at the end of Armstrong's book. You could elaborate on what knots are. Um, you could talk of homology, simplicial complex, homology of a simplicial complex, and so on. There's, there's a list of possibilities there. Whew. So that's the, the project. Any, any questions before I go on to today's lecture? Will that be online? So what does online mean? Online means it will be published online. The doc. Oh, the, this document. Yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll send this document. Or I'll send this document around um, by Blackboard l l later. You know, after this lecture. When is it due? Um, I, I'll have to work that one out. But I guess it should be due um, just prior to the exam starting. So the the, the last week of uh, semester. I think we have Easter and then we, you know, so probably the last, the last week of, I probably, I'd say the last Friday of semester would, is when it's due. Okay, so, so that it doesn't, I don't want it to interfere with your exam study week or anything. So, so the last week of semester, I'll, I'll work that date out and put it done. Any other questions? No? So just once again, uh, if you can find partners, and form a group of two or three on your own that's that's perfect but not everybody will be able to do that i know last year some for various reasons so if you if you want help finding a partner just email me and as i say i'll keep a list of the names and then i'll you know i'll help as what well, i maybe circulate a list of names of people who are looking or whatever like that you know to the people who are looking so email me if you if you need help finding a partner okay any more questions? Nope. Then to today's lecture. Um, I'm in the process of trying to explain uh, uh, or describe a subjective continuous mapping. Uh, I won't manage to do that today, but let's just recall uh, this is what I'm up to. I'm, I'm working towards, and I'm going to have to do some more theory to get there, but I'm working towards the, the following. Um, so last time, uh, uh, we were we were constructing a, a function, or we actually constructed uh, a function f from the closed interval from zero one to this solid equilang equilateral triangular region in the in the plane and how did we construct it we constructed it by working out various functions f1 f2 f3 uh, and then what we did uh, we we took f to be the limit as n tends to infinity of those functions. So what I did last time, I defined f1, f2, f3, f4, and fn, uh, and I said that this was the, 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 the function f um, that we're, we're going. Uh, so, so what were these fn's? Let me just remind myself. Here, um, fn 
of t was defined by subdividing the triangle, equilateral triangular region, by subdividing uh, the equilateral triangular region into small subtriangles. Yeah, so um, we had the triangular region and then I took midpoints uh, and I subdivided using you know the midpoints to get small subtriangles and then each subtriangle I took midpoints and I broke each one up and so on um, what did I do uh, each subtriangle this um, and then each one of those I subdivided so on uh, and so for Fn we, we saw last time that each subtriangle was of side subtriangles of side at the nth stage the length of the the the, the subtriangle was of, of, the, the, of the side of a subtriangle was a, was of length um, 2 to the n minus 1 and we worked that one out okay so that's what we, ha we had last time and then for fixed t let me change color for a fixed f fix some number t in the interval from 0 to 1 um, and for fixed t we get the following sequence uh, f1 of t, f2 of t, f3 of t and so on and that sequence is a Cauchy sequence so I introduced uh, the notion of a Cauchy sequence at the end of the last lecture so what does that mean that means that a sequence is Cauchy if um, for any epsilon you give me I can find a capital N such that uh, Fi and Fj lie within an epsilon of each other whenever I and J are greater than N yeah, so you give me a smaller uh, an epsilon as you like uh, and what I see is that Fn, Fn uh, is defined by taking these small triangles and if you if you look at it Fn plus 1 is defined by taking a sub uh, division of a small triangle so uh, you see that this is a Cauchy sequence because um, if, if I take a capital N, you know, if I take an N and I'm taking, you know, this 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 subdivision where the, the size of the triangle is 1 over 2 to the N minus 1, for every subsequent I and J, F I of T and F J of T are going to lie in that, in, that, in that triangle. They're not going to go outside the triangle. And so I can make the triangle as small as possible for all I, J. So it's a Cauchy sequence. That was badly explained. Think about it, okay? So, um, but but by construction, this is a Cauchy sequence. So the first thing you have to do is remind yourself what a Cauchy sequence was from the end of last lecture, and then convince yourself that it's it's obviously a Cauchy sequence. Um, and then, what did we know about Cauchy sequences? I quoted at the end of last lecture. Uh, I said I'm not going to prove it from analysis. I, you might, no, you wouldn't have proved it in metric spaces. But it's it's you know it's one of these things that that, that can be proved. Every Cauchy sequence converges. So, um, uh, so for fixed T, the sequence is a Cauchy sequence, comma, uh, and hence converges by the theorem given at the end of last lecture. Uh, 
Yeah? So we're using the fact that this construction produces a Cauchy sequence. So using that easy fact uh, and the theorem to say, well, that sequence then, for any given t, converges. Um, now, what? So, so that's good. This converges, so that that's that's useful. I mean, this this otherwise we wouldn't have a function. This definition is fine in in that it, it gives us a function. Two things we have to do. One is easy, and one is is more involved. Uh, the easy thing is we have to check that this function is continuous, and is not you know. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll say something about that in a moment. And then more involved, we have to show um, that this function is surjective onto the equilateral triangular region. There we have to think a bit more. But, but for, for continuity, um, well, I have two ways I could do it. I could make a, a, a mountain out of a molehill and I could go to the every pre-image of an open set is, is open and so on and, and go through all of that and confound everybody. Or I could just work intuitively, which is what I'll do, and I'll say, look, what does open mean? I'd say, what does continuous mean? A function is continuous, intuitively, if a small change in input yields only a small change in output. That's at the intuitive level. A small change in input yields only a small change in output. Um, well, you can see that by this construction, um, each of these functions is continuous. And by construction, if I, if I change the input t just a little bit, the output, you can just see, changes just a little bit. So a small change of input clearly uses just a small change in output. So it's not difficult to, to, to see that it's continuous. Let me write that down. Um, where am I? My pen is... Now I've done something. Oops, what have I done? There we go. Um, so let me write that down. If if I go to a different colour, if t is close to t prime, in other words, if I change my input t just a little bit to t prime, then f of t, by construction, is close to f of t prime. And thus... Intuitively, um, small change in input is only a small change in output. You've got a continuous function. The function is continuous. Uh, a good exercise and not particularly difficult is to translate this intuitive idea into a formal a uh, proof of continuity by you know checking that the pre-image pre of every open set is open uh, but, but you can do that as well so it's not difficult to convert this to a rigor rigorous argument I'd rather spend my time on the difficult aspects rather than the easy aspects, you know, making them look difficult. Um, so what's the difficult thing to do? It remains to prove that the function f is subjective. Once I show that this function f is subjective, then we've got Peano's theorem, um, uh, you know, of, of, a, of, a, of a continuous onto function from a, a, a one-dimensional, you know, line, uh, open uh, a segment of the real line, onto the two-dimensional uh, triangular region. Um, now, how do we prove that? To prove this. we'll use compactness. Um, of the 
interval from 0 to 1. Yeah? So see the second occurs on homework because that's all about a proof of that. So you'll have done that for homework. See second occurs on Yeah, so that's that's quite a you know demanding proof, uh, but we'll use that and some more results which I'll have to introduce, and some related results. Yeah, because I'm always kind of when I'm giving when I'm teaching a topic, a topic is all any topic you teach is vast, and I like to kind of just teach as 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 little as I need to about a topic. Uh, and so what, I, what I'm what i doing here is I'm taking one result, Piano's result, and say, that's a good result. To, to let, me, let me convince everybody about Piano's result. Um, and now I'm, I'm going to give you just the amount of topology needed to prove Piano's result. Yeah? So when I say related results, it's, that, that's my kind of excuse for introducing now just what's needed to, to prove subjectivity of F. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about some related results, which initially won't seem particularly related to, to, to what I've been talking about, but eventually, you know, the, the link will, should be transparent enough. So, so um, some theory. Some theory which we need in order to prove that this function f of piano is subjective. Well, theory often involves definition, so I'm going to start out with a, yet another definition. Um, but it's a very basic definition, so any course would, would include it anyway. Definition. Uh, let, let's suppose you have a topological space X. That can be any topological space you like. Now I want to tell you what a subset, a subset uh, A in X is uh, said to be and now I want to introduce a word I want to introduce a word there, okay, and that word is just going to be shorthand for uh, whatever that word is, it's, it's said to be if um, its complement um, x minus a is open, okay? So, this is the definition. I haven't chosen the word yet, but topological spaces, all you need for a topological space is to know what the open sets are. So, a topological space is a set X together with a collection of, of subsets which are deemed to be open, satisfying some axioms. So, topological spaces are all about open sets. So, it would be handy to introduce a word to capture the fact that not that A is open, but that X minus A, everything in X which isn't in A, is open. So it would be good to introduce a word. And I hope, so far in this course, I probably have by mistake, but I hope I've not used the following word. Because this comes the definition. Can anybody tell me, uh, if you did metric spaces, what's this word I'm going to introduce? Anybody tell me in the chat? Closed, yeah, closed. So um, the word I'm going to introduce, and hopefully I've not used it before in these lectures, that's the definition. What do we mean by a, a closed subset? This is the definition. We mean that its complement is open. That's all we mean. We could use any word we like, but closed seems to be, well, you know, related to open. So that's, the, that's, that's what it means for something to be closed. Um, okay. Let's do some examples. Examples of closed. What does closed mean? Example. Um, the subset, let's take A to be the subset of all of those numbers 
greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to one, uh, of the, the 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 real line with the usual topology. Um, uh, is a closed subset why uh, this is because its complement is open this is because the real line with the usual topology minus this collection of numbers uh, greater than or equal to zero less than or equal to one what is it it's it's everything from minus infinity up to and excluding zero union uh, everything from um uh, not zero one up to infinity and that is a, a union of two open subsets, so this is open. So this here on the right-hand side is definitely open, and so by definition, this set here, 0, 1, is closed. So I may, by m mistake, have talked of the closed interval, but it didn't really mean anything until this point. Um, this is what I mean when I say closed interval. I mean that the complement is open. Okay? You will have, we will have used the word closed for this interval in first year. It all agrees, okay? It's all consistent. So, so, so but, but that now is the def. That blue, this is kind of important. This is uh, this definition is what we mean by closed. There's no other definition of closed. That's it. Okay. Any questions? Uh, okay. Another example. Um, Example, um, if I take the collection of numbers greater than zero and less than or equal to one, then that set, it's not, that set is not open with the usual topology. Because one is in the set, and like you know, it's 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 not open, and it's not closed because the complement isn't open either. So that set there is neither open nor closed. Yeah. So, you know, most sets are neither open nor closed. Some sets happen to be open. Some sets happen to be closed, but they're only closed if their complement is open. And then there are plenty of examples of sets which are neither open nor closed. Any questions on that? Then I have to introduce another uh, term. So this is another definition. Um, let A be a sub. I'm going to talk about a point of accumulation. So let A be a subset of a topological space X. Let A be a subset of a topological space X. Tidy up my P. Um, what do I mean by a point of accumulation? That's, that's the word I want to get across now. A point of accumulation of A, or an accumulation point, I should say. A point P in X is an accumulation point. This is another word now I'm, I'm introducing. So two definitions on the chart is maybe a bit much, but I don't see any other way to do it. So is an accumulation point uh, of A 
What does that mean? Um, if every open subset of A containing P, if every sorry, every open subset U um, of X of X containing P uh, also contains some point of A well other than P. So let me put a box around that. I find that a nerdy definition. Maybe a picture will will help with this one. Let me try to, to give a picture. Um, what's my picture? Um, so we've got a... Uh, what, what, what am I saying here? We've got a topological... So I'm, I'm going to draw the picture. What, what's going on in my mind here? So I've got a topological space X. Oops, let me do, do a a thinner uh, line. I've got a topological space X and I've got a subspace uh, which I'm calling A. A is a subspace of X so that's A. Now I want to explain what's, a, what's, a, what's an accumulation point. An accumulation point, what colour should I use? Red I suppose. An accumulation point could be something like this point here, P. Because in that picture, what am I saying? There's a point P. Uh, the picture is trying to illustrate that if you take a, an open subset of X, an open subset of X, which contains P, then that open subset is going to contain something in A other than P. Yeah, that's the picture. Um, you could also have an accumulation point right in the middle. You know, again, uh, if you have a point right in the middle of A, any open set of X containing P will also contain uh, some point of A other than P. So that picture is trying to, to capture what this definition says precisely. So uh, let's do some examples of accumulation points and then what I'll do is I'll relate accumulation points to, to the notion of being closed. Accumulation points are somehow related to the notion of being closed but before I explain that we need some examples of accumulation points. So, so let me go back to black. Example Um, let's consider the topological space, the real line, with the usual topology. Uh, and let's consider the set A consisting of all of those numbers greater than zero and less than or equal to 1. Uh, so there's an example. Uh, can anybody give me an accumulation point? Either in the microphone or in the chat. Um, can anybody give me an accumulation point for this set A? 0, okay, somebody is giving me 0, two people are giving me 0. Can anybody give me any other accumulation point? Can you give me another accumulation point? Any, yeah, a half, yeah, in fact, any. So, so what we've got is any point in A is an accumulation point. Any point in A is an accumulation point. So too is 0, yep. Uh, so in this example, uh, then... Um, every point of A is an accumulation point. Uh, 
uh, also this point zero which isn't in a but is an accumulation point also zero is an accumulation point uh, even though zero is not actually in the set A. Yeah. So an accumulation point then is any point P such that when you take an open neighborhood of P, that open neighborhood contains uh, some point of A uh, other than P itself. Yeah, so zero is fine because any open neighborhood of zero is going to contain something in this uh, interval A. Let's do another example. Um, another example. Uh, let's consider. Let's continue with the real line. So let x equal the real line, usual topology, Euclidean topology. Uh, consider the following set. Consider the set A, uh, follow my notes, oh yeah, to be the reciprocals 1 over n for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, so on, you know, all, all, all natural numbers. So A consists of 1, a half, a third, a quarter, a fifth, and so on. Uh, can anybody give me an accumulation point? of this set. So in this example can anybody give me an accumulation point? A point yep I'd go along with that zero for example zero is such that any open neighborhood of zero is going to contain some element of A because uh, all of these fractions, uh, 1 over n, gets very, very close to 0. So whatever open neighborhood you take of 0, you're going to include something in A. Uh, 0 isn't actually in A. And are there any other, it's a yes-no question, are there any other um, accumulation points? Yes, no. Is 0 the only accumulation point? Yes or no? Is 0 the only accumulation point? Yes or no? Silence. Yes, yes, okay, yes, a couple of yeses. And so in this example, zero is the only accumulation point. Yeah. So there are plenty of points in A, there's infinitely many points in A, but none of them are accumulation points. Yeah, because Around each 1 over n, you know, 1 over 27, you can take a little neighborhood that doesn't intersect uh, 1 over 28 or, you know, it doesn't intersect any other number. So it's the only accumulation point. So what have we, let me just summarize now, what have I done? Uh, I've said that a, I've defined what an accumulation point is. I've given you an example such that every point of A is an accumulation point of A together with some point zero not in A is also an accumulation point and I've given you another example where no point of A is an accumulation point but zero which isn't in A is an accumulation point um, and, and I started off this theory by talking about a seemingly unrelated concept of being closed. A set A is closed if and only if its complement is open. So now what I want to do is I want to relate accumulation points and the notion of being closed. So let me do that with a proposition uh, in blue. Proposition and here it comes a set A 
in a topological space X, a subset A of a topological space X is closed. Well, we have the definition. It's closed if and only if you know its its complement is open. But here's a here's a result now. It's closed if and only if it contains all of its accumulation points. So that's a theorem that uh, is going to be used in proving um, the piano curve result. Let's just go back. I'll, I'll come down again. But let, let's. Here's an example. This set doesn't contain all of this set A from zero to one, uh, excluding zero, doesn't contain all its accumulation points. It doesn't contain zero. Since it doesn't contain its accumulation, all its accumulation points, the, the proposition I just stated says that it's not closed. A set is closed if and only if it contains all its accumulation points. So, for example, the set um, 0, 1 is closed. And lo and behold, it does contain all of its accumulation points. It contains 0, 1, and everything else. Is, you know, but it contains all its accumulation points. So, that's the proposition that relates um, accumulation points to... Uh, and I think I have... I have two minutes. I'm going to give the proof, okay? And then we'll, 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 then we'll be done. So I'm going to give the proof of this because it'll 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 speed us up. So let, let me just give the proof. I'm a little bit short of time. I've only got two more. Well, maybe maybe th three minutes. Uh, so I won't ask too many questions. I'll just r r run through the proof. Okay. So here's the proof live. Suppose A is closed. Yeah. Then what do I have to show? I have to show that it contains its accumulation points. Well, how do I do that? Suppose A is closed. Then what does that mean? That means that the complement of A is open. That's the definition. Then X minus A is open. Yeah, that's the definition. Now, any point X... Um, in the complement lies in the open subset lies in the open set x minus a that's a tautology okay T take the complement of a it's an open set any point in the complement lies in the complement which is an open set since it lies in the complement the complement x minus a doesn't have any intersection with a. The complement of a doesn't intersect with a. It has empty intersection. So x can't be an accumulation point. So no point x in the complement can be an accumulation point. Why? Because for a point to be an accumulation point, it has to have the property that every open set containing it intersects with A. But any X in the complement is in the complement itself, which is open, and the complement doesn't intersect with A. So, yeah, you know, it's... it's um... So what does that tell us? Any accumulation point of A, any accumulation point that A has, can't lie outside of A. Well, if it doesn't lie outside of A, where does it lie? It lies inside of A. So any accumulation point must lie in A.
Okay, another half to do. Uh, let's suppose then, now conversely, that A, let, let me change the blue, suppose that um, A contains all its accumulation points, can we deduce that A would then be closed? I'm doing the converse. So, uh, conversely, um, suppose A contains all its accumulation points. And somehow I have to convince myself that in that case A is closed. How do I do that? Take some point in the complement. Any point. Uh, let me write it down. Um, in the complement. So, since X is not an accumulation point, because x, in, um, if, if x lies outside of A, I'm assuming that it's not an accumulation point. So since x is not an accumulation point, because it doesn't lie inside A, there must exist an open set containing x which doesn't intersect with A. Um, we can find an open set um, which I say U containing X which doesn't intersect a. In other words, U lies in the complement of A. Yeah, that's because you know X is is not is is not an accumulation point. You can do that. Now, what I'd like to do is this open set. There's many open sets, but this open set somehow depends on X. So I think rather than calling that open set U, I'd rather call it U subscript X. So for each X, I can find an open set U X containing X uh, which 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 doesn't intersect with A. But then, what can I say? Well, let me take the union over all of the points x not in the complement. Oh, sorry, not in A. All the set points x in the complement. Let me take the union of all of these sets ux. And what you see about those is really they their union is just... Is simply that, isn't it? Because certainly every point of the complement lies in this union, but in fact none of these uxs intersect with A, so every ux is in the complement. So you get this equality here. Uh, but what does that mean? This is a union of open. Each ux is open. This is a union of open sets. Yep. What do we know about in a topological space? A union of open sets is open. But what's our shorthand for saying that the complement of A is open? If X minus A is open, another way of saying that is to say that A is closed. And that's the proof done. Okay, I went, I went three minutes over. Um, so now we're in a good position. Uh, next time, in, in just five minutes, I can establish for you that the, um, the, the, this, this function f that we have from the closed unit interval to the equilateral triangular region, I can, I can establish that that is actually onto. It is subjective. I can do that at the beginning of, of the next lecture. Okay, any, any questions? Sorry for a bit rushed and going a little bit over, but... While you're thinking of your questions, I'll stop recording. Um, uh, 
I'll stop recording.